just uh, back to Mayar, who will get our first talk started. Sure. Um, all right. Um, so our first speaker um, is Professor Maxim Rajinsky uh, from uh, UIUC, and uh, he's going to uh, speak about universal approximation of sequence to sequence transformations by temporal convolutional neural networks. And the floor is yours, uh, Professor Radinsky. Welcome. All right. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to, uh, to talk at this, uh, summer school, uh, winter school, sorry. Um, okay. So I'm going to share the slides. You can, you can all see this, right? Um, let me, uh, make this bigger this is good right everybody can everybody can see this yes yes great yes so so um you know i i was going to i, I was asked to give kind of a, a talk of a more tutorial nature um and i think i found a topic that uh that at the same time accomplishes to give some uh some tutorial aspects um in, in introducing some classical work uh, and ideas that uh, are not very widely known, but also um, gives me an opportunity to present some of the research going on in my in my group. In the particular, this is joint work with uh, my PhD student uh, Josh Hansen. Um, okay, so so the title is kind of long. Uh, let me um, unpack it a bit. Let's see. All right. I'm just trying to struggle. I mean, it's not full screen. Um, that's why I'm. Okay, here we are. All right. So, so, so we're talking about sequence to sequence models in machine learning, right? Um, so this is becoming kind of a, a really the new frontier, right? Where um, you essentially use something like a convolutional architecture or possibly other things like attention to process whole sequences instead of uh, updating some sort of a state moving on to the next element in the sequence, updating the state, et cetera. Um, you process entire sequences using you know, various uh, uh, combinations of uh, uh, structured nonlinearities composed with one another. And these are becoming really the de facto standard in, in large scale applications. Why is that the case? Um, I mean, if you look at recurrent models, RNNs and related things, or even feed forward models, Really, uh, from the viewpoint of universal approximation theory, they're both uh, um, inherently suited for, for this sort of thing, right? We have universal approximation theorems for, for both types of systems. Give me uh, uh, enough complexity, enough size, enough neurons, enough layers, et cetera, I'll be able to approximate various uh, classes of objects in a, given, uh, in a given metric space to a desired degree. So why is it that uh, um, we can talk about temporal convolutional net. So the idea of a temporal convolutional net is if I have a sequence that I'm processing, right? So I wanna map a sequence to a sequence. So what I do is I have a window of a given, let's say given width. Uh, and with transformers, there's not even a, a width. You just take the whole thing in. But let's, let's now think about a simplified version where you have a window of a given width, you slide it along your sequence and the contents of that, of that window are passed through a large feed forward architecture. Right, and then you slide it over. Right, so um, well, RNNs theoretically can 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 have unlimited memory about about their inputs, right? Um, because the if you unroll the recursion for for a discrete time state space model, you see exactly how, uh, in principle, you can have you can have memory of of past inputs, right? Um, but at the same time, there are uh, noted phenomena that that uh, they cannot always capture long-term dependencies, right? And we also know that uh, unlimited memory is usually unnecessary in practice. Again, you know, this notion of, it, it may, it may uh, seem strange that when I'm talking about state-based models and unlimited memory, but at the same time, what I'm talking about is not really uh, memory of the state. I'm talking about the evolution of the state and the output being determined by the initial state, right? And by all the inputs, uh, uh, um, input uh, values up to that time. That's when I, what, so when I talk about um, unlimited memory, this is what I mean. But of course, you know, the, the, uh, the idea behind using these kind of highly parallelizable architectures like TCNs or transformers is that 
Well, you can basically parallelize things quite a bit. You can basically process shifted uh, versions of the same sequence in parallel without really um, without really waiting until you know one processing step is over. So, so the idea is to answer the following questions. When uh, do these convolutional architectures provide better approximation than recurrent architectures? And what do we mean by limited long range dependence, right? If we wanna uh, model systems with uh, uh, using limited long range dependence, we might as well ask what, what, you know, what that means. All right, I think I, uh, yeah, let me, okay. Good, this is better. Okay, so the question uh, whether we need recurrent models at all um, pops up from time to time. So this is a paper from uh, 2019 ICLR by uh, uh, John Miller and Moritz Hart about stable recurrent models. And the title says stable recurrent models. The point of this paper is that if you have enough stability, um, so the system forgets its initial condition, let's say, or something like that, then you can replace a recurrent model with uh, a feed forward architecture. Right, you basically, what you do is you slide a window along your input sequence and ignore everything outside that window, process that, and you know, move the window over and you keep going. In principle, this is, you, you can always represent the, um, the um, processing in that window by a state, but of course the state is gonna be uh, uh, you know, augmented in terms of dimension, right? So it might not even be useful to think about these in terms of recurrent models. You might just think about this in terms of autoregressive uh, feed-forward models, right? So, so this, is, uh, this is 2019. The thing is that these kind of models are actually um, rather common in, uh, in uh, the modeling of nonlinear systems. So let me uh, first introduce you know, the setting. So we're interested in so for now, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, sequence to sequence models where both the input and output sequence are uh, um, are scalar valued for simplicity. But you can extend all of this to vector valued sequences as well. Um, so what we have is a nonlinear operator that takes a sequence u consisting of real entries and outputs a sequence y also consisting of real entries. We're going to assume the following two properties. We're going to assume causality, which basically means that if um, if two sequences have the same uh, past, so up to time t, then the output sequences will be the same as well, right? And we also have to assume something called time invariance when our time index, and we all know what time invariance means. You know, the the, the shifting uh, um, shifting of the um, origin of the time does not really change the operation. When we have one sided sequences, we have to be slightly careful what time invariance means. But really, it means the following: that if I give you a sequence u naught, u one, et cetera, that there, that results in output u, u y one, y naught, y one, et cetera. Then if I just pad this in, input sequence with an arbitrary number of zeros in the beginning, then the output resulting from this padded sequence will be uh, the output of the original due to the original sequence padded with the same number of zeros at the beginning. So this is to, and, and you have to postulate this for every, for every number of zeros that you add. Again, because of the one-sidedness of uh, of these sequences, because normally when we teach time invariance in let's say a uh, DSP class, we consider two-sided sequences. We just set them all to zero for causality. But but when you deal with one-sided sequences, you have to be somewhat more pedantic. But anyway, causality and time invariance just mean exactly what uh, what we're used to. Um, now, the basic structure that I want to talk about, and the the, the one that will emerge uh, um, from all of this is the following. So I'd like to consider systems that have uh, additional internal structure. And it goes like this. So I map an input sequence U to an output sequence Y, but the way this is done is as follows. At each time T, um, you look at the contents of your input up to time T. And you use that to extract um, an n-dimensional vector, right? So here, this this uh, capital N is uh, is the dimension of that vector, and the output at time t is determined by the contents of that vector only through some function f, right? So 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 here the idea is that um, what are these the components of that vector are determined as follows. So you have your input sequence, you have a bank of 
LTI systems, linear time invariant systems, which in discrete time are implemented by convolutions. So you, 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 you uh, feed your input sequence in parallel into a finite number of convolutional filters. At each time t, they, each of them spits out a real number. And then you, and, and there are finitely many uh, uh, LTI systems in this bank. You take the output of that bank and you send that through a fixed nonlinearity f. And so this is a canonical architecture we'll be dealing with. It's interesting that using different forms of f, you end up with different kinds of systems. For example, v1, uh, uh, v1 through vn are real numbers. So you can have a multivariate polynomial. If f is a multivariate polynomial, then this is actually a discrete time Volterra series with finitely many terms. Uh, and, and these types of uh, systems were actually um, uh, analyzed by, uh, um, by Steve Boyd in his, uh, in his doctoral, uh, in his doctoral uh, work at, um, at Berkeley. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if you want to be more modern, you can take F to be a composition of, uh, of affine maps and lattice maps. What are lattice maps? Basically, you take the coordinates of a vector and you apply finitely many pointwise mins and maxes. And of course, these days we think about mins and maxes as implemented by ReLUs. But uh, uh, a classic paper by Erwin Sandberg from uh, 1985, instead of polynomials for F, considers these, uh, um, these maps were a composition of an affine map and the lattice map. And it is interesting that if we view Sandberg's work, from the modern perspective, this is uh, a feed-forward uh, ReLU neural net, right? Because uh, the um, interleaving of affine maps with um, ReLU processes, with, with, with ReLU units, is exactly how you can implement a lattice map, right? So, so, uh, so that, that'll be our, our class of models. All right. So the next thing is um, uh, this notion of approximately finite memory. And it looks kind of you know, formidable, but really what it means is the following. So suppose I have a system F, again, nonlinear. It maps discrete time input signals U to discrete time out output signals Y. We will say it has approximately finite memory of the following holds. Suppose I want to determine the output at time T. I give you two different inputs. I give you the original input, which is represented here on top. And I give you also um, an input that is obtained by windowing the original input. So basically just forget everything up to a window of, of uh, length M. So you start at the most recent time. And you know, once you hit the, this context length, you just zero the signal out. So you see the, you know, the on top, the input signal has uh, non-zero entries everywhere. And on the bottom, you zero out everything outside the window of length M, and then you compare the outputs due, due, to, uh, due to the original sequence and this windowed sequence. And we say that the system has approximately finite memory, approximately finite memory if these two inputs, uh, output sequences stay the same uh, for all times and for all inputs in some class, like uniformly in time and uniformly in, in the inputs in some class. Right, so then we say that your system F has approximately finite memory, and then for a given tolerance epsilon, M star F gives us the memory link. This is how much, so here the idea is that the distant, distant past of various inputs does not affect the current outputs. And this assumption holds in a variety of settings. If we're talking about something like electronic systems, for example, it definitely holds for systems that don't really have very long transients, right? Okay, so any questions so far? Yes, Maxime. Uh, what are the assumptions on the input? Um, and um, the, the motivation for my question is, uh, just to give you what, I, what I'm thinking, is if F was the identity and the, and the sequence you already had, um, let's say it was an autoregressive, it came from an autoregressive model, then you know that this exists um, right. So the, the, on the other hand, if the input is potentially very arbitrary, this may not uh, be realizable. So, so my question is, what is the role of the input and the map F that allows this to be possible? Uh, well, that will actually, great question. We'll actually get that. We'll impose some assumptions on, on all of these. 
um, later on. For now, I just want to want to emphasize that this definition you have to specify a class of inputs a priori, and you obviously have to impose some sort of um, some sort of um, limitations on the class uh, on the map f. Really, uh, if you want to get technical, this will be a certain continuity property of, of f in in a properly uh, uh, properly defined topology for the inputs. But yeah. but but the idea of approximately finite memory, like I said, the uh, conceptually just means that the system um, is only affected by the most recent past of the input. Okay, so all right, so so um, we're going to say the following. Let's talk about finite memory maps and temporal convolutionalness. So if I set this epsilon tolerance to zero and this m star f of zero is finite, then we say that it has like f has finite memory. So, so it doesn't mean approximately finite memory, actually exactly finite memory. And that means that f operates actually by looking at a window of length m and only processing what's in that window. Um, so, for, so a canonical example is a sliding window map, right? So, so you only look at, um, you know, each time t, you ignore the input outside of a window of length m, and that determines the output. And, and again, we have to set uh, uh, the input to zero at negative indices. And of course, this, this f is going to be causal, but it's not going to be time invariant unless, unless this uh, readout nonlinearity set, sends, zero, sends the old zero vector to zero. Again, you know, like this is the artifact of uh, one-sidedness of, uh, of your inputs. Um, so here's an example of a temporal convolutional net. It's a finite memory map. Um, and we say it has context length m if this f here the one here has the following form. It's a composition of a bunch of affine maps interleaved with uh, pointwise values, right? And then we say that uh, uh, the number of layers is the depth and uh, the maximum of the dimensions of these affine uh, maps through the layers is the width. So we're going to argue that this is already uh, a rich enough class to approximate certain classes of systems that have approximate finite memory on, on certain classes of inputs. But this is the idea. But the, so, so when Erwin Sandberg in the 90s worked on these things, he didn't call it you know, temporal convolutional nets. He didn't use the term ReLU, but he did, use the, he, he did emphasize the use of the nonlinearities came from pointwise uh, minima and maxima, so lattice operations. And he motivated this by saying that you can implement this using diodes. Right? And so what I'm going to say is that TCNs are universal approximators. And the idea here is that uh, any causal and time invariant IO map F that satisfies some additional continuity requirement, and in order to talk about continuity, you have to restrict inputs in a suitable way, can be approximated to a sufficiently to, to an arbitrary accuracy by a sufficiently wide and deep TCN. So this is the idea. We have a uh, we have a, a M plus one values of the input, we ignore everything else. Those inputs go through a ReLU net. And that becomes the output, the approximate output at time t. And again, I, I really want to emphasize the contribution of Erwin Sandberg, who, who uh, in, in you know, 1991 actually showed that any such f can be approximated by a finite memory map f hat of the following form. It's a composition of an affine map and the lattice map. And an affine, you know, so, so, so basically all the affine processing is done first. And then uh, uh, on top of that, you have uh, finitely many um, applications of uh, coordinate wise mins and maxes. Again, you know, you can rearrange this and treat this as um, as a value map. And the reason why I would call it a convolutional map is, is, is well, the linear operations are implemented by convolutions, the nonlinearity is implemented by, by values. Now, um, what I want to do in this talk is actually, first of all, make it quantitative. So, because Sandberg didn't really, you know, specify how many units you need. Uh, and then I want to relate this to recurrent systems as well. Okay, so again, this is kind of the tutorial part. This is, you know, like read papers that, you know, you should read, you should be reading papers that, you know, were published before 2011, even if you're working on deep learning. So this is a paper by Sandberg called Structure Theorems for Nonlinear Systems from 1991. Uh, and, and you can see the structure is precisely um, essentially you can think about this as uh, the, the inner uh, affine maps composed with an outer layer of um, ReLU type neurons. So what I'm gonna do is replace this by deeper nets. 
and make everything quantitative, but the key ideas are really due to Sandberg. Um, Incidentally, Sandberg also, uh, you know, for, for those of you who, who are familiar with, with, with control theoretic ideas, Sandberg also independently uh, uh, discovered the, um, uh, the circle criterion for, for uh, uh, some small gain type criteria for stability, but, you know, didn't really get, get credit for it as much as, as, much as others. Um, anyway, okay, so going back to... Uh, um, going back to uh, Renee's question, we're going to assume the following. We're going to assume that F, our map that we try to approximate is causal, time invariant, has approximately finite memory on uniformly bounded inputs. So the, in so the only thing I'm assuming for the inputs is they're uniformly bounded. Um, in continuous time, if I were doing this in continuous time, I'd also have to assume that they're uniformly Lipschitz. So, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, circuits, you would have to say that the signals have bounded dynamic range and bounded slew rate. But for discrete time, it suffices to just assume you know, uh, bounded dynamic range. And, um, and now I'm also gonna work with, um, so if I look at my IO map F, for each time T, I can construct a, um, a nonlinear functional that I define as follows. I look at the input U, right? So the functional takes inputs X naught through XT, what, what, what the idea here is that I look at any input u such that its uh, segment from zero to t has coordinates x naught through xt, and then uh, that functional just outputs the output at, 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 uh, at time t. So let me uh, close this. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna assume that this functional is uniformly continuous on the cube minus, uh, the, with a side minus r to r. R here is the uh, uh, bound on the norm of the input at each time. And it has a certain modulus of continuity. So here the idea is that if I were to look at, so give me a given time width, time length, uh, I'm gonna look at the functional that, that tells me the output value just at time T as a function of the history of the input. That functional has to be uniformly continuous. Right, so you know, if you think back to your universal approximation theorems for neural nets, it's very similar, right? You need to impose some sort of assumptions on uh, um, on all of these things, right? You need to impose some assumption uh, on the function you're trying to approximate. In this case, this uh, uh, causal time invariant has approximately finite memory, but there's also some additional continuity that we need. That, that we need. Um, okay, so here's the result. So suppose our map F satisfies these requirements. Then for any desired epsilon, which is the accuracy I want, and some gamma, which is kind of a tuning parameter, I can construct a temporal convolutional net F hat with the following parameters. So the context length, this, this is the, the width of the window that you slide along your sequence is determined by the memory length of your sequence, of your system um, at resolution gamma epsilon. So gamma is between zero and one. In principle, you can set gamma to one, um, if you want, and therefore you could, you will, you will have uh, um, um, epsilon approximation, or you know you can set gamma to like one half or something like that. So, so, so the context length and the width are are comparable. You have to have like extra dimensions add to the to the net. But the depth now is this is very similar to your classic, you know, results on deep net approximation. You have the inverse modulus of continuity of your system that you're trying to approximate. You have, the, you have the size of dynamic range. And notice that this is exponential in, uh, in the width. Again, this is generically uh, the best you can do. If you look at the papers by, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, Dmitry Yurotsky or uh, uh, Boris Hanen and Mark Selke on these things, you will see that this is, this is more, more or less generic unless you introduce more assumptions. Uh, maybe of the Baron class or something like that. But here the idea is that gamma is really a tunable parameter and you can use it to trade off the context length against the depth. And you also notice that this approximating system I've had is causal, but is not time invariant, even though F is. And again, this has to do with the fact that, you know, this, this, this uh, um, uh, TCN, this, this, this ReLU net uh, does not necessarily map all zeros to zero because of the affine, uh, nature of uh, the linear portion. And the proof is actually very simple. The idea is that 
first we're going to choose uh, m to be the uh, the, the memory um, the approximate memory length for our system, and then we can see that once we window the input to length m, we might as well just forget our original system that operates on infinite sequences and restrict it to this functional that only takes the inputs from time zero to time t. And we already know that this input is uniformly continuous with a certain modulus of continuity. Now we can use this wonderful result uh, due to uh, Hanyan and Selke that essentially can be thought of, I like to think about as a uh, um, quantitative kakutani crime theorem. You know, if you're familiar with uh, uh, results like the stone weierstrass theorem that tell you that if you have um, a class of functions which forms an algebra, can separate points, et cetera, then, then you can approximate um, all continuous functions on a compact set by elements of, of that algebra. This is a version of that where um, all you need is really instead of algebra, you need a lattice operation. So you need you know min and max as as your basic operation to replace uh, to replace multiplication. And the Kakutani crime crime theorem basically says you can you you can you know once you have the lattice structure you you can have universal approximation. And Hanyan and Selke actually quantified this. So 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 basically once we uh, forget everything happening outside the window of length m, we can just use the classic uh, ReLU uh, neural net approximation result. And the rest is just triangle inequality. You just you know stitch everything together, All right? So it's, you know, it seems like it's a simple thing, but it, you know usually you know I, I, the, the types of results I like are the ones where first you line up all the right definitions, and then the the, the proofs should more or less write themselves once you have all the all the right definitions. Okay, so like I said, I want to emphasize that the width of the window that you slide along your sequence is determined by the approximate uh, memory length of your original system. And the depth of the um, uh, ReLU neural net is determined by the inverse modulus of continuity, as you would have in the classic results, like let's say Michele and Mascar for uh, feedforward uh, neural nets approximating continuous functions. And uh, instead of the dimension, right? This is basically the dimension of the input, right? This is the uh, uh, M star. Okay, so any questions before I move on? Because now that we talked about this, I want to see how this places in the context of uh, state space models or recurrent models. I have three questions, Maxim. Okay. The first one is a little bit historical and, and connecting to the 91 reference that you were mentioning. Yeah. So as, as you know, the results on universal approximation for neural networks came around the same time, uh, 89, Sibenko, Hornig. Yeah. So my, my first question of the three is, the result that you, uh, that you quoted from 91, in what sense is different from the results on universal approximation for static networks without this windowing um, that due to Sibenko and Hornig? Um, well, okay, so, so results of Sibenko, Hornig, Stinchcomb and White, <clears throat> dealt with approximation of functions, right? Yep. So you have a function on a compact subset uh, of, of uh, Euclidean space that, that has, uh, uh, that mapped it to a real number. Sandberg was interested in uh, uh, approximating um, maps that map function spaces to function spaces with additional requirements, structural requirements like causality or translation invariance, because, you know, in principle, you could also apply this to images. He did not restrict the time uh, set to be uh, to be just an integer line. You can have, uh, let's say, a, a two-dimensional lattice. So now you have images, and you can have. Uh, uh, so the, the the window is replaced by an uh, by an appropriate patch. Translation invariance has to replace time invariance, etc. So he was interested in. So so in spirit, these results are closer to 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 the paper of Chen and Chen, but we're interested in approximating uh, uh, dynamical systems by something like neural nets. Right. But he was uh, citing all the, you know, all, all of the neural net approximation results. And he actually uh, also had some of the first results on, you know, so re refined results on approximating these things by uh, radial basis function nets. Yeah. Um, my second question pertains the, the role of depth versus width. If we think about the classical results that we were just discussing, mm -hmm. they usually have one hidden layer, yes. but then the depth can be arbitrarily large. 
What is quite striking of the results that you have here is you that- mean the width can be arbitrarily large. Yeah, the width, sorry, sorry yeah. I, I misspoke. Yeah, the width could be arbitrarily large, but the depth was just a single hidden layer. So what's yeah, quite yeah. striking here is that you get uh, the width being exactly equal to M, but the depth is potentially much larger. Right. Do you have any analog or parallel with respect to the results uh, on uh, deep depth versus width around 2015-ish? Uh, even I think there is a colleague from UIUC that has worked Matus, on that. Matus Tolgarski, right? the depth separation. I, I think these are slightly different questions, right? Because, you know, there, uh, the question was like, are there functions uh, for which uh, deeper network will have fewer units, like appreciably fewer units than, 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 than a shallow net? This is slightly different, right? Because uh, in a sense, if you fix the width to be a constant, you can almost pertain, perform kind of a, like rotation operation. You stand the, you know, wide network on its, uh, on its side, so to speak. Because, for example, if you look at, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the result that's closest in spirit is, let's say, Michele and Mascar, where the inverse modulus of continuity plays a role, um, the number of neurons you need to, to attain in, in, in a two-layer net, so this is the width, the number of neurons you need to attain approximation of epsilon is roughly, you know, one over the inverse modulus of continuity at epsilon to the power of the dimension. So conceptually, you can think of, uh, about uh, you can think of this as as again kind of standing such a you know infinitely you know very wide network on its side and and trading depth for width. Great. And my last for example, there there are works by like say uh, uh, I know that Matus Tolgarski is a much you know is basically the 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 you know the expert on this, but you know this is the what I know. And my last question, I think it was I had anticipated that if if you had a sequence that was generated by a system with some fixed uh, memory, mm -hmm. uh, then when you try to approximate it, uh, you would get uh, an estimate of that memory that may be a little bit larger than the true. But this is just my intuition, so I have no idea. And so here it seems that if, if I had, if, I don't think you have the result anymore, but I think you had something like 2M and M, for the, yes, okay, okay, exactly here. So M, you actually get the exactly M and the width is M plus two. Right. Can, can you comment a little bit on these differences of M versus M plus two? And in the next slide, I think it was just M. Uh, no, uh, M plus two is here, right? I mean, it's, it's this is the, this is the, um, let's see, can I say this is the, oh, width should be M plus two here, actually. Okay. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a typo. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I mean, like I said, this this comes this comes from the fact that you know you you need to have affine maps in order to really uh, uh, approximate this uh, universally. That answers my question. I was very surprised that you could get it exactly with that. that no, no, no. It's ten plus two. I actually need to fix that. Great, um, thanks. Great, thanks. Okay, so so let's see. So now let's connect this to state space models because I mean we 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 like we, we like recurrent models. Right, because you know, I mean, if, if you're in working in control, all this newfangled stuff with you know sequences and whatnot seems weird. And Kalman said we should work with state spaces and we should work with state spaces, right? So so let's look at a discrete time state space realization. So we have this uh, uh, state that gets updated uh, based on the current input, and the output gets updated based on the state. There's some initial condition. Um, F is a state transition map. G is the output of measurement map. And again, this map is causal but not time invariant unless uh, F and G uh, map the initial condition and the zero input to, you know, do appropriate uh, things, right? And so here, you can, know, this is kind of the link between the state space view and the frequency domain view, if you will, right? The frequency domain view, the classical view, view you know, looks at these things from this pure input-output perspective. We don't care what's inside, as long as it's internally stable, whatever. We only look at uh, the input and output terminals and, uh, and the IO map can always be written down. Right, it's a composition of G and the flow map of, of the state space model. The question is, when does such a state space model have approximately finite memory? So if I were to look at, you know, look inside the black, black box, take this internal view, when uh, do I have approximately finite memory? It turns out that this, you know, one sufficient condition is something called incremental stability. So this is a, a 
this is kind of an analog of uh, uh, transient and steady state responses for nonlinear systems. So we have a state space model. We don't look at the output because stability is only with respect to state trajectory. And we say the system is incrementally stable, again, on a given class of inputs, if the following holds. If I give you an input from that class and I give you two different initial conditions and I have these systems running in parallel, fed by the same input, starting from two different initial conditions, then the distance between um, their states, right, the, the flows is determined by a function that um, increases with the distance between the initial conditions. And if the initial conditions are the same, that function should be zero, obviously. And also this function decreases as you make the time longer. So in other words, here, the idea is that the initial conditions determine the transient. Transient is not very long lasting and then the steady state uh, is eventually reached. And you can, you know, and you can relate this to things like input to state stability and related, related notions. So this is, so the increment here uh, refers to uh, just the systems are the same in every respect, except they started, uh, they had the different initial, uh, different initial conditions. So, you know, one classic example is something like exponential stability, where this beta RT is uh, uh, lambda to the power T, lambda is between zero and one. Um, and, you know, and you can actually re express the, prop, uh, the way in which errors propagate due to the same initial condition, but two different inputs, right? Because remember, we talk about when we talk about approximately finite memory, what we do is we actually restrict the input, right? We take the input and we cut off everything from the past of that input up to the M most recent moments. So we want to see what happens to our system with the same initial condition because the initial condition is part of the system specification. And it turns out that you can quantify this in terms of uh, this beta function. So if the system is incrementally stable, then you can, uh, you know, you can also answer the question of what happens when I feed it with two different inputs. And the proof is, you know, very simple, kind of a telescoping argument. And then you use the semi-group property, right? Because, you know, the whole point of the state is that it, state at time t gives you all the information you need in order to determine where the system will be next. And with this result, we can establish uh, incremental stability as a sufficient condition for approximately finite memory when they can actually quantify it, right? So if I have a state space model, where uh, the state transition map is Lipschitz in X in the state, and the output map is Lipschitz. And uh, for each, and then you also have, a, um, you know, this basic classic stability, right? Uh, uh, um, bounded uh, forward invariant sets. So for each initial condition, there exists a compact set such that the states remain in that set for every U in your input class. Uh, and the system is incrementally stable and the sum of these betas, right, is finite. So this is kind of summable, right? So remember the betas tell me uh, the, uh, the length of the transients, so to speak, and the sensitivity to initial condition. So here, what I'm doing is I, uh, I fix the difference between initial conditions and I start computing sort of the propagation of, of, of errors due to initial condition. Th the, these errors do not accumulate without bound. And if that's the case, then you know the system will be approximately it will have approximately finite memory and satisfy satisfy the uniform continuity condition that is required by the universal approximation theorem. And the summability condition actually is is rather weak. Like for example, you don't have to have exponential decay of errors. You can have polynomial decay of errors as long as it's the the, the exponent is uh, is nice enough. Uh, I mean, the proof is uh, like I said, it's 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 rather simple for approximately finite memory. Take two inputs, you know, one is the original input, the other one is the windowed version, use the propagation of errors estimate, and then use the monotonicity properties of this map and the summability to see that you, know, you, you, you eventually forget um, the distant past of the inputs. And for uniform continuity, basically the same, the same argument. So, so, so this, this idea, if your system is incrementally stable, and you can trade difference in inputs for difference in initial conditions is, uh, uh, is very helpful. Now, I wanna apply this to uh, a particular type of stability that we're used to, which is contraction, right? So Miller and Hart, for example, they, you know, they, again, they were looking at recurrent, they were looking at recurrent models that uh, were contracted. So the state space uh, dynamics, basically is, is, is contractive, right? So if I give you the same input 
for two different states, um, you you know the distance between the corresponding next states shrinks by a factor of lambda. And then they show that the induced input-output map has approximately finite memory with um, width that is logarithmic in one over epsilon. So of course, remember that this, this uh, width determines the depth of the neural net. So if the depth is polylogarithmic in one over epsilon, that's pretty good. Your net does not even have to be that deep, right? So this is in fact an immediate consequence of the fact that any such contractive system is exponentially incrementally stable, right? So you can just derive this result from a previous theorem. But uh, the question is, do we really need contractivity in order to guarantee exponential incremental stability? And uh, this was actually one of the motivations for, for our work on this. We actually showed that you can get away with, with a much broader criterion. The idea is that you don't have to have contraction Euclidean norm. There can be a norm which is determined by the system by a suitable Lyapunov function. And you know, in discrete time Lyapunov functions, the best ones are quadratic, they are strongly convex. So the matrix P that determines that, that Lyapunov function induces a norm. So if your system is contractive in that norm, then you can, you can basically just change coordinates to that, to that, uh, to that new uh, state space and, and get contractivity. And this was actually um, worked out in Russia by Demidovich, right? So, so, so in discrete time, he basically had this kind of condition. Suppose the state transition map F is differentiable in the state and there exists a symmetric positive definite matrix P and some constant mu, such that this holds. So this is uh, this is a matrix inequality, right? So this is the Jacobian of the state transition with respect to the state multiplied by p. So so this matrix is negative semi-definite for all for all u's uh, and for all the states. For all u's are bounded. Then the state space model is exponentially incrementally stable for all inputs u, with uh, you know again uniformly bounded, and this beta functional, the one that tells you, the one that certifies stability is actually uh, of the exponentially decaying form. And you see that uh, uh, it's determined by the condition number P and by the, you know, by, by mu and mu here is, is, is this kind of eigenvalue parameter. And again, for continuous time uh, systems, this was proposed by Demidovich in 1960s. And so the contraction criterion that, uh, uh, that for example, uh, Jean-Jacques Slotin is, is well known for, uh, basically, it's kind of a version of this. Um, and in fact, um, uh, this proposition by itself is, is, is more or less, if you, if you uh, study um, various stability notions for nonlinear systems in, in the context of nonlinear control, this should be very familiar. So for example, there's a nice paper by Tran, Ruthler, and, uh, and Kellett in 2017. So we didn't really have to do much. Um, I don't think I even wanna uh, go through a proof sketch because it's, you know, it's very simple. The idea here is you introduce the norm that is given by, uh, you know, the, the weight matrix comes from your, your Lyapunov function, and then you change coordinates to that, uh, uh, to that other description, right? So um, then you show contractivity, and then you just iterate the state space description, et cetera, right? So here the idea is that um, the interpretation is that if I have a, a kind of a diagonal system where I start two initial conditions, C and C prime, and then run the systems in, system in parallel with the same input, then the distance between their corresponding states in this weighted norm is the Lyapunov function for this uh, diagonal system. But that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is actually the following. How does the Demidovich criterion relate to contraction? So it's obvious, you know, so, so suppose we do have this Demidovich criterion. And as I said, all we need to do is introduce an invertible coordinate change. So we change those new state variables, x tilde, which are given by multiplying the original state by the square root of p. <coughs> and then when you, trans and when you uh, express everything in that coordinate system, you actually get classic, uh, you, uh, classic contractivity, but in this, in this other norm, right? So the Demidovich criterion gives us an invertible change of coordinates that gives us contraction. So can we actually demonstrate uh, you know, come up with a nice example, right? So, oh, well, first I want to talk about, you know, the implication for universal approximation. This is exactly where um, you have a state space model with Lipschitz continuous state updates, Lipschitz continuous output maps, and a Demidovich criterion. And here you assume that um, 
<coughs> sorry, talking so long usually dries, <clears throat> dries my throat out. Oh, you can assume here that um, zero state and zero input are the equilibrium point. And then the IO map with zero initial condition satisfies the approximately finite memory and continuity assumptions with these bounds. And as you can see, the fact that uh, the memory length is polylogarithmic in one over epsilon is very nice. It basically gives us <coughs> exactly this um, result that Miller and Hart had. I need get some water. Now that's much better. <clears throat> right, so, so the IO map of any such system can be approximated by uh, a system whose window length is logarithmic in one over an ep epsilon and depth is quasi polynomial in one over epsilon. So it's. <coughs> exponential in, in log one over epsilon. All right. Um, <clears throat> Quick question. So right, right. Yes. Um, can you comment a little bit more on the role of the parameter mu? Uh, which I think it was the rate of the contraction. And so it seems to me that if mu is getting closer to one, then both the uh, M and W estimates are not so well behaved. Yes, so yes. You want, yeah, you want mu to be, you know, to be less than one. In fact, it's even um, stated here. Yeah, if mu is one, it's not that interesting. I mean, it's, you don't really get much. You don't get contraction, right? So I'll give you an example of a system where uh, where uh, where mu is less than one, and this is the uh, Luria systems, right? So for which establishing contraction using classical methods is not easy, right? So so this is a uh, this is a, a single input single output state space model of the following form: we have a state x, we have an input u, and notice here that. Um, there's a nonlinearity in the state update, right? And you can think about this as an LTI system with matrices A, B, and C used with um, nonlinear negative feedback. When V here, the input to the system, is actually a nonlinearity uh, determined by uh, the error. Right, so you can think about u as the reference input and y is the output, and this is determined by the by the by by its nonlinearity. And the question, and these systems were studied as as, as prototypical, you know, simple nonlinear systems for which you could possibly establish stability. Um, so, 1940s, in fact, in in the Soviet Union, uh, by people like Luria, Postnikov, uh, uh, Mark Eiserman, and and, and 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 the like. So it's. You can, you know, you can easily convince yourself that, you know, in general, this does not have to be contractive in, 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 in the original Euclidean space. Nevertheless, is it possible to get the Midorich criterion for this? So this is where the circle criterion comes in, like a very, very nice uh, uh, criterion for, uh, for stability of nonlinear systems. So we're going to assume nonlinearity sigma is differentiable, has a fixed point at zero, and satisfies what's called a slope condition. So it's, it's, uh, its derivative is bounded between uh, A and B. And we assume that uh, this triple A B, A, B, and C is a minimal, minimal stable realization of, uh, uh, of the state space model, right? So, so, this, so this, uh, this is a, a A is stable, right? So it means that the spectral radius is less than one. Um, the pair A, B is, controllable, the pair AC is observable. This is just a linear part. And we also assume that the transfer function, which is, uh, this should be Z, not S, because these are Z transforms. I need to correct that. But this transfer function, um, its Hardy norm on the unit circle is bounded by some constant gamma. Um, and R here is, um, you know, so, so, so this gamma, the square of gamma is larger than uh, the square of R for all A's in the radius uh, in, in this interval between A and B. It, it basically, it's, it's, it's a classic circle criterion. You have to look at a discrete time Nyquist plot for the system. And, and uh, here the idea is the Ny Nyquist plot lies within a certain, uh, within a cer uh, within a certain circle. 
And then, the, and then here the idea is that the under the above assumptions, this nonlinear non system satisfies the discrete time Demidovich criterion for some mu, which is less than one, but bigger than uh, square of the spectral radius of A. Um, right, and, and the proof uses some ideas from control. There's something called the discrete time bounded real lemma. Um, the, under these assumptions, you can find you know, matrices L, W, and the symmetric positive definite P, such that various matrix equalities hold. Um, R naught is, uh, is, is some constant between the spectral radius of A and one. And then you let mu be, you know, the square of that R naught. And then you just manipulate things in such a way that, uh, you know, because of all these equalities, you can show that, uh, I mean, what is this? This is basically the, um, edges of of the state transition right because if if we the whole point of the slope condition here is that um you can see what the system is doing by replacing the nonlinearity with you know the constrained version right if nonlinearity is bounded um you can see what's going on by looking at the extreme sort of you know the, the linear systems that sort of bracket the system from inside and, and the outside um and then you write down the jacobian of the state space transition you see what's going on you can you can basically prove this result so um the point is that i mean okay so this is kind of an esoteric result from 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 control theory but on the other hand it gives you an example of the class of systems that are not necessarily contractive in you know in this original uh coordinate system but uh, under sufficient conditions like i said the circle criterion uh having to do with uh the, so the circle criterion only Pertains, mm, pertains to the linear part of the system. So it's discrete time Nyquist plot has to lie in the circle of a given radius. And uh, the nonlinearity, the only thing that nonlinearity has to satisfy has to be differentiable sun zero to zero and have bounded derivatives. So it's uh, it's not very restrictive. So the point is that, uh, yes. Sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, so how do you compare or contrast this method to the method of integral quadratic constraints in terms of uh, conservatism? Uh, okay. Um, I mean, they, they, they should roughly give you more or less the same thing because, you know, uh, IQC, I mean, like developed by Magretsky and, and other people, I mean, it was more or less kind of a, an, an elaboration on some of these ideas. I don't. I don't think they should be more conservative than IQC. I mean, you could you could do this using IQC. I don't think it's going to give you anything more conservative. Than that. And I wonder if you really need differentiability of the nonlinearity as long as you can bound the slope of the you know any line that connects. Uh, I mean, work? okay, differentiability is only needed uh, at some point to apply the mean value theorem, and you can do this with sub differential. Mm -hmm. right. All right. I see. Okay. Anyway, so so this is uh, um, this is the end. And in fact, this this uh, this was uh, presented uh, by Josh at NeurIPS twenty nineteen. So it's an old paper of I guess uh, by various standards, like definitely before the, right before the pandemic. But I I, I I thought it was a nice set of results and ideas that that could be presented in this kind of semi tutorial form. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the support from um, Camel, which is the um, NSF Center, uh, Industry University Center, uh, Center for Advanced Electronics through Machine Learning, which actually you know uh, provide a lot of inspiration for my recent research uh, on on machine learning. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maxime, for such a great uh, talk. I think the floor is open for questions. Um, if you're uh, one of the panelists, just uh, raise your hand and, and ask your questions. Otherwise, uh, there is a Q&A, uh, and I'm happy to uh, ask your questions to Maxime. Yeah, if there are any questions, uh, you know, I'd be happy to take them. One quick question I see thus far is whether you're willing to share the slides. Oh, uh, yes, as, as after I fix all the typos. And yes. Great. Uh, we'll post them then on the website. Uh, the recording will also be po po posted on the website. Um, I'll continue with, with the same question about the role of, of mu. I... Uh, 
I think what you said was that yes, mu is important and cases where mu is close to one are less interesting. And I think you were trying to connect with the Luray example there, but I didn't fully understand for the Luray example, um, what is the mu that results from it and how close to one is it? So if, if you could just provide a little bit more intuition, oh, sure, yeah. the, um, the role of mu uh, on the story, that'll be great. Yes. So um, basically the idea is if you want exponential stability, um, mu is going to be, uh, you set this up in terms of LMIs, basically. I mean, this is, this is, this was one of the first examples of the use of LMIs um, in the context of uh, stability for nonlinear systems. And, and mu is basically going to be some sort of a, a, a some sort of a parameter in, in your LMI. You search for it together with, with P. Um, in the context of the Lurier example, you can see that um, basically mu is going to be confined um, in the interval. So it's going to be at least, it has to be strictly larger than the square of the spectral radius of the A matrix. So that means that if your if your original LTI system is uh, closer to marginally stable, then you know mu is going to be closer to one. So it's marginal stability regime that's interesting, but the, the, but this theory, I mean, the contraction theory doesn't cover the marginally stable case either, right? So so for that you need some you know slightly different methods. Great. Um, there are two questions from the audience. The first one is: Are there any data-driven methods to determine stability of a system? Data-driven methods, um, good question. I mean, so if you don't know the system dynamics, um, you can formulate this as a learning problem, uh, which, which does amount to basically estimating either, you know, the spectral radius or the top eigenvalue of some matrix. And of course, there you get into all sorts of computational intractability issues, uh, <clears throat> but you could in principle, what you could do is um, learn the Lyapunov function jointly with the, with the system's dynamics. So for example, there's a nice paper by uh, Manek and Coulter that, 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 that attempted to do exactly that. So the idea is that you, know, you, 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 uh, you come up with a class of models for your system, let's say some neural nets or some other universal approximator, and you come up with a parameterization for Lyapunov functions, typically quadratic, or maybe piecewise quadratic or something like that. And if you haven't put output data from the system, you just simply uh, uh, jointly learn both the Lyapunov function with the desired, uh, uh, you know, possibly with, with desired tolerances. And then you look at, and then you can just, you know, look at how well this thing generalizes or cross validates. Presumably that'll give you some, some, some you know, some, some uh, pack-like uh, certificate of stability. Great. The next question is how the state based TCN behave when the memory length change periodically according to the states? Oh, okay. So that's already a, a much wider class. In other words, I, I see. So in other words, what you do is you look at the content of your, remember that the TCN really, <clears throat> okay. So you could treat this as a state space model, right? Because all you really do is uh, you, you, you aggregate the states, you know, according to the length of your memory and then you keep updating that. If you change this dynamically as a function of states, this becomes a much wider class of models, uh, which of course is going to be more expressive already. Um, that it's an interesting question, and 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 uh, uh, I'm sure one could pose this question almost maybe in the context of something like neuroscience, where you have neurons that you know that that do have fading memory, and yet somehow. Uh, what they can accomplish could be persistent. You could have cycles or other periodic uh, uh, pattern signals. But I guess optimizing the dependence of this uh, memory length on the state, I mean, it's an interesting question that I have not thought about. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's <clears throat> obviously, you know, once, once we enter the territory of all of these sequence to sequence models, all sorts of things become, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, Directions for uh, directions for uh, for exploration. Thank you, Maxim. So on that note, uh, let me thank Professor Maxim Raginsky. He is a associate professor at the University of Illinois. He's actually 
the director of the Tripods Institute at Illinois, and uh, uh, he and I are collaborating on uh, extending our Tripods Institutes moving forward to a phase two. He's done really many uh, fundamental contributions in controls, information theory, optimization, and machine learning. And um, he, uh, we're really thankful that he has presented to us his great work at the intersection of learning and control. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Maxim. Thank you. So let's take a three-minute break um, while uh, we set up for the next speaker. <laughs> 